Psalm 121 tonight as we uh, take a look at uh, safe in the arms of Jesus or he keeps me he keeps me. So we're going to be looking at that this evening. Eight verses here in this wonderful little psalm. So let's read it together and we'll just uh, give you a little idea. Or well, let me give you a little background then we'll read it, all right? What's going on with this psalm is this is in the time of the reign of Hezekiah. How I many remember Hezekiah? All right, this is in the time of the reign of Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah is uh, taking, he's uh, leading uh, Judah and Jerusalem, all right, southern kingdom. And uh, they're the Assyrian army is on the march, which way outnumbers Israel, and uh, there, and Judah there, and, and they are pressing hard on Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, King Hezekiah, he's uh, worried, you know, the captain of, of the Lord's people. And uh, he's uh, quite, matter of fact, he's sweating it right now. Matter of fact, he's in, uh, he's in a state of desperation. And so he, uh, this psalm we comes to is a psalm of where he cries out, for God's help. Anybody ever cry out for God's help? You ever been in a time in your life when you're desperate for something? And you know, everybody's desperation or time of desperation is different than others. What you may think is desperate in your life, something you're going through, may be mild to someone else and vice versa. But this was a time when, you know, you're sitting there and looking out over the horizon and there's a multi hundreds of hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers coming your way uh, and you have no way of uh, tackling that or standing up against that kind of army. Uh, you'd better start crying out for help. But, I, you know, I don't know what uh, situation people are in and what you're facing uh, in your health, in your, your life, your finances, your home, your business, your marriage. I mean, everything, I mean, it can turn into a time of desperation and we can get desperate. And uh, I've seen that and I think we've all experienced that. And the best place for you and I to go in time of desperation is to cry out unto the Lord. Because if you read Psalm 120, it is a prayer of deliverance. And so we're looking at 121 tonight. So that kind of gives you a little idea of what's going on. And this was a psalm that they would sing on their way up to Jerusalem. Everything, and no matter where you're at geographical, everything is always up to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is actually elevated in that area above everything. So we're going up to Jerusalem. We're going up to Jerusalem. And this was the same psalm uh, that was being sung when they were headed up to Jerusalem in the time of Jesus when he was 12 years old going into the temple. And you can read that in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52 uh, of that. So the same psalm. And, and so they sing it even today, uh, the Jewish people, in time of desperation. And I'm telling you, sometimes, I'll tell you what, when you face cancer, you're in a time of desperation in your life. Uh, when you're going through a bitter divorce uh, in someone's family, they're in a time of desperation. Uh, sometimes when tragic comes to a family, it's a time of, of desperate a time in their family. Uh, finances sometimes when somebody goes flat broke and are busted and, and hasn't got a dime to, uh, you know, or a pocket or uh, a penny. Uh, they're, they're desperate. Uh, and, the, and, and when we as believers, especially when we go through that, whether it be individually churches or our church, you know, it, it's a time that we cry out unto the Lord. And so we're going to look at that today because, you see, we need to understand no matter how desperate it gets, church, if you're saved tonight, you are safe in the arms of Jesus. Okay? No matter how desperate it gets or how hard it gets, He keeps you. He keeps you. All right? So let's take a look at it beginning in verse number 1, and then we'll take it and break it down a little bit. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Notice we're lifting up. We're looking up. And why are we doing that? From whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Some great, ver great stuff here in, in these verses here. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. 
May we pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these comfort of these eight verses. Thank you for all the promises we see here, the security we see here that we have when we cry out for help. And, and really, we have nowhere else to go when we are desperate, Lord, than to turn to you. And yet, sometimes we think we can handle it. We can do it on our own. We got the answers. We can figure it out. We're tough. We're bad. You know, uh, we're, you know we're big kids. Oh, Lord, we need to cry out to you. You want us to cry out to you. You love it when we come to you and cry out to you because we're in total dependence on you. And, uh, Lord, and so we lean on you and we depend on you. So we cry out to you tonight from our hearts. So, Father, what, whatever it is in, in everyone's life here tonight, whatever we're going through, may we cry out to you through this psalm tonight. And may we be comforted as we, we go our separate ways in a few moments from now. Uh, once again, Holy Spirit, be our teacher and our guide. We ask that you would bless us, comfort us, uh, and use us. And we ask you, Lord, that you again, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our guide, that he will teach us all truth, guide us into truth, bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us and showed to us this week. And, Lord, we always ask for your anointing in this hour upon your servant, and we'll receive it by faith because we ask it in faith believing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. By just way of introduction, some of what I've already said to you actually is that uh, the challenges that, that you and I as believers face along life's journey. I mean, we, we face a lot of challenges uh, daily, sometimes weekly. Matter of fact, these last three and a half years, we've had to uh, face a lot of challenges. We've had to learn how to live different, act different, do different. I mean, uh, change everything. Uh, you know, nothing's normal anymore. But and nothing will be normal again, but Jesus is coming. Amen. So, you have to, so uh, in, in the scriptures, the word of God describes the Christian journey as a walk. And you know that we're to walk in the spirit, and, and we have much about that. It's described as a race. Remember, Paul said we're running a race uh, set before us. Uh, our Christian journey in life is, is described as a war, as a fight. Paul said we're good soldiers, and he said I have fought a good fight. And we're in a spiritual battle in Ephesians 6 uh, that he talks about. So that's how our life as a journey is described. And, and then we have this journey up to Jerusalem. This is the song that they sung journeying on their way uh, to Jerusalem. And this was the same song when Jesus went to Jerusalem when he was about uh, 12 years of age. You can read that again in Luke uh, 2, 41 through 52. And I think we see two wonderful truths we can learn from this. And of course, there's a lot more, but i uh, share with you. We need to trust God to provide our needs. We need to trust God. See, when things get desperate, you're going to have to rely on the Lord to trust Him for your needs. And that may come sooner than you think. You know, we don't know what's going on in, in, in the world right now and what's happening and, and where our, uh, you know, our fearless leader is taking us and, uh, and, and the decisions he's making every day. They're going to have such a, a, an effect that's going to be unbelievable. Uh, I mean, it is, and it's, 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 just, it's sad uh, what's, what's going down. And yet, uh, you know, we, we're, we're already in uh, an inflation big time. We're already started into a recession, and that's coming even greater. And, of course, our, our leader is taking us in that direction, and, and that's what he wants to. And, uh, and the new stuff that he's passing, and, and oh, my goodness, and it's just unbearable. And so we're going to have to trust God to provide for our needs, whether it be our family, individuals, our church. You know, folks can get worse here, too. It can get harder times here as we move on, uh, as we face these challenges. And, and we're going to have to cry out unto God uh, and depend on Him to take care of our needs. And then we, need, then we learn in this passage, too, everyone needs help. Okay, folks, everyone needs help. I don't care who you are, you need help. You may be Supergirl or Superman or Spider-Man or Batman, whatever. But, uh, you know, the Hulk, you need help. Everyone needs help. So we see that right off the bat. Let's get into it. First of all, number one, uh, that we see my helper. Who's my helper tonight? What's verse 2 tell us? What's verse 1 tell us? Verse 1 says, I'll lift up my eyes, and, 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 and whence cometh my help? And here he goes, verse 2, my help cometh from the Lord. So you see, your help tonight is the Lord. Matter of fact, He is the Lord. He is my King. 
And help's going to come from your king, King Jesus. Notice what else he said in that verse about it. He said about this wonderful help. It's found up there also in verse 2. He cometh from the Lord which made what? Heaven and earth. The creator of heaven and earth. Where's your help coming from tonight? It's coming from the king, the Lord, who is the creator of heaven and earth. Now, if God can create heaven and earth, and the Chinese aren't going to buy the moon, so you don't have to worry about that, because that's God's moon, and and nobody's going to mess with it, all right? They can try to colonize it all they want to, and it's not going to work, because that belongs to the Lord, all right? And you just understand that. But they they do. They want to buy it and, and colonize it. It's unbelievable. No, God is the creator of heaven and earth. And if God can create the heaven and the earth and the stars and the Milky Ways and all of that, David, he can help you and I when we need some help. And all he's doing, you know what he does? He's more than willing to and wanting to. He's just waiting for us to ask him. You know, Lord, I need some help. Help, help me, please. Well, I get in the car, I walk around the block and I scream. Man, are you kidding me? And God's not deaf, but I just want to make sure he hears me. Amen. Look at verses 4 and 5. Uh, and look what he said there in verses 4. Now, we'll jump around in, this, in, in here in the verses, but in 4 and 5, he said, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. In other words, in verses 4, then in verse 5, again, uh, we find, but in verse 4, he's the one who guards Israel. That's another word for keep. How many believe God keeps you tonight? See, I said you could title this tonight, He Keeps Me. See, God guards you and I. And what does He guard us from? Well, He guards us from evil. He guards us from the evil one. Uh, Notice what else about this one who you need to call out to help to. How many of you ever called somebody and and asked for help and the line was busy? Or they called and and you got this recording. Uh, Sorry, uh, I'm not here. Leave a message. I'll get back with you just as soon as I can. I I laugh at those. And and, and I make comments sometimes. But I know who I'm making comments to. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, But it is. You you call and, 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 and nobody's there. I called this one today. This was really weird. I called this uh, gentleman, and uh, it was a number, and all of a sudden, this, uh, uh, this is Google, Google Computer Answering Service. Uh, the number you have called is not available at this time. Would you like us to try to get in touch with him? This is from Google. This is a computer talking to me. And I go, yeah, go right ahead. And sure enough, they start ringing his number. And they come back and say, sorry, we cannot reach him. Uh, he's not available. Uh, and then it really got fat. Would you like to leave a message at this time? I said, yeah, I'll leave a message. Tell the gentleman he has my number. Call me back. Thank you. I was talking to a computer. I said, this ain't right. Something's wrong with this. I called the number again, and the guy answered. I said, are you aware what this Google computer just did? He goes, oh, that thing, it don't ever act right. It's a, but, I mean, that's, that's the technology where we're at today. Now, if I need help, I don't want to talk to a computer. You understand that? When I need help and I call you and ask for help, I, I, I'm exp- the reason why I'm calling you because I feel like I can depend on you, I can count on you, and you're going to be there for me. But when it's not, what are you going to do? You see, well, you see, we don't have to, and you say, well, uh, wait a minute, uh, uh, he or she can't come because they're sleeping. Or right now they're kind of napping, you know, sleep, slumber. He never slumbers. But, you know, see, this was great. When we call on God, church, tonight, he's never asleep. He's never slumber, and he never napping, like so many of you. All right, amen. So that's why, uh, you know, always the Lord is my, uh, my first, choice, first, first choice, but if not, I try some of you, and then the Lord's always my backup. I can always, he's got my six. Amen, hallelujah. All right, also in verses 3 and 4, notice what, the Lord who does not slumber, he does nap, he does not nap or sleep. Now, that's my helper. What kind of helper do you have tonight? My helper is the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He guards Israel and he guards and keeps me. Amen. And I don't have to worry about him going to sleep or taking a nap or not being at home. He's always there. That's what the psalmist is talking about because Hezekiah is in desperation. Hey, there's an advancing army coming after us and we don't have the means or the manpower to to meet this and stand up to it. God, we need your help. Now, what in the world would Hezekiah do if the Lord was taking a nap or he was asleep or slumbering? It could be too late. It could be too late. So, and here we see this because we also recognize in verse 1, number 2, we look at ourselves and how helpless we are. Helpless me. Helpless me. And, and how do we look at that? Well, look at verse 1. What are he talking about in verse 1 with me? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. 
Now, what were they doing? They're on a journey going up to Jerusalem, right? Amen. So life's journey tonight, church, is compared to climbing steep hills. Life's journey is compared to climbing. St- Anybody ever hear climb steep hills? Pretty rough and tough, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier going down, isn't it? <laughs> you better watch yourself. You might go rolling, get down quicker and faster than you expect, all right? So here's the thing. Now, here's in- it's interesting. I'm trying to help you. And we're in life's journey. Journey is like climbing up hills, steep hills. And so now when you're climbing up that steep hill, where are you looking? Up. You're looking up, right? You don't look down. You look up. We, when we're walking up a hill, we look up the hill. We don't look down the hill. We look up the hill if we're going to walk up the hill, you see. And that's what we want to do. So, you see, so the psalmist again, he goes, where's my help? He says, I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up to God. I'm going to look up to the Lord. That's where my health's coming from. I'm going to look up in life's journey tonight as we're traveling. And we're on, we're on a journey walking up steep hills. All right? And so that keeps us looking up. That's why, G, that's why we're encouraged looking to Jesus who's the author and finished by ourselves. We're to be looking and hastening for that glorious appearing of Christ. Well, if we're not looking up, how are we only going to see it? Because we're to be looking for it. And so, so we need to understand that. You see, we, we look at what's really cool. In God's vision, the hills are inspiring. We're looking up at the awe, the awe-inspiring hills that the Lord has made. Oh, I hope heaven's got mountains in it. Then we, then we see the all-sufficient helper in verse 2. He's all-sufficient. Look at him here. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. It doesn't get any more efficient than that. God doesn't lack in anything, church. Try to help you tonight when, you get, when you're desperate. Whatever your desperation is tonight, whatever you're crying out for tonight, take this little psalm and lesson tonight and apply it. Yeah, apply it. Cry out unto the Lord. Ask Him for help. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. Man, yell it from the housetop. Man, if you have to, go out here in the middle of the ball field and just holler. what I used to do and hope to get back to doing it. Get out there in the ball field. You get a little further out to where all the people are sleeping. Amen. If they're saved and in the Lord, they're just sleeping. Now, if they don't know the Lord, they're pretty dead for right now. But the believers are just sleeping. They're waiting to hear the shout and the sound of the trumpet to get up and rise up. So you can get out there with the mower running. You can shout all you want to. Now, they ain't going to hear you. Because I've tried it, and it don't work. I try, to, I try to fake them out a little bit. Get up! Come up! And nothing moves. It's not the right voice, the right tone. They know Michael, what it's going to sound like, and there's going to be a trumpet. But, hey, you need to cry out to God, church. Don't be, don't be afraid to cry out to the Lord because, you know, when it comes to it, you and I are helpless. And just like Hezekiah was in his situation, he was helpless. I mean, what are we going to do? We cannot face this army, this onslaught of this army. We're going to be wiped out. And most of the time when Israel is in all those fights and those enemies, they were always wanting to annihilate them and totally just take them off the planet. And they've been trying to do it ever since. And guess what? They're still hanging around. About 8 million of them over there living in Jerusalem. I mean, <laughs> ah, no, no, no. So you see, your help comes from the Lord. Uh, You've got to look up to God. Listen to what Hebrews 4.16 says there in your notes. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Where's the throne of grace? Up. Where's God living? Up. He's in heaven. He's on a throne, right? All right. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now you see, when you're in desperate, you have a need. And God's the only one that can supply that need, and He's the only one that can help us in that time. So that's what's wonderful. That's what's great about it. So praise the Lord. So we find He's my helper, especially when I'm helpless. But not only is He my helper, He's my keeper. He's my guardian. Look at verse 5 with me. 
All right, verse 5 there, he's my guardian. The scripture says, the Lord is my keeper, or is thy keeper. He's thy guardian. He's my guardian. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. So we find that he's our guardian. The Lord is my keeper. In other words, uh, he, he's my keeper here, and we, we, we sometimes he takes care of us uh, when we're faced with the problem of weariness. See, when we're tired and weary, then guess what? He takes care of us because, and then he, he illustrates it here as he's talking about. He said, now he knows uh, how, to, how easy it is for us to get weary. Amen. He knows how easy it is for us to slack down, fall out, and all that. Got another message we're going to be working on, strength for the journey. We're getting ready to go into fall and winter, and nine months of just eight months have gone by, and we've gotten a little tired and weary, and we need a little strength to finish out the year. To face everything. Strength for the journey. See, we're on a journey. So we're working on that. We'll see how that goes in the days ahead. All right. So look what he, how he compares life here again. Not only was it going up the hill, but now he compares it to a desert. A desert. Now, I'll tell you something. When you're in the desert, you're going to get weary. And you're going to get tired. And you're going to have a need in the desert. The desert in your life or whatever you're going through. And he's the only one who's going to be able to help you in that time of that desert, in a time of need. And, and see, because why? He knows uh, that there's times uh, to slip. He knows when it's a time to, when you're going to sleep. So it's easy. But we have this journey in the desert and know what he says. Ah, when you're in the desert, guess what? God is your shade at your right hand. See, they don't, there's not a whole lot of shade in the desert, church. Unless you happen to be fortunate and blessed and find an oasis and some palm trees and, and some spring coming up. And then you got some shade, amen? The only shade you're going to get in the desert is sit down, take your turban and unwind it. Take a stick and stick it in front of you and let that protect you from the sun. But just think about it. When you and I are in the desert of life and we're, we're traveling this journey and, and here we, we've come from here to here. And you know how you go and, and, and you're crossing the next thing you maybe come across the valley and start to head down the valley on the other side. And you look up and you go, oh my goodness, there's a, there's a desert out in front of us. How are we going to cross the desert? Supplies and needs and everything. And I'm telling you, in our lives, we come into deserts. Desert places. But thank God because he keeps me. He's my guardian. He's going to shade me uh, uh, by my right hand, at my right hand. Oh, my goodness, because I'm weak. I'm tired. I, I, I'm thirsty. I, I need, and God's going to take care. And by the way, when we're in the desert, church, we're very vulnerable. When you're in this world and you're weary and you're tired, that's when you're vulnerable. That's when the devil's coming after you. Boy, when your strength is zapped and you're spiritually zapped and you're down, watch out, the devil's coming after you. I mean, he's going to throw everything he can at you. And, and I know, and you know. And, and you have to wonder, what is going on? But God has a purpose and a reason for everything we're going through. And we need to trust him in it while we're going through it. So you might find yourself in a desert tonight. You might find yourself weak, vulnerable. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm vulnerable. And, and where all the saints are in it, at all seasons. Notice he's also number two there. He's shade in the hot summer desert is gold. If you can find shade in the hot summer desert, that's like gold. And by the way, guess what? God owns all the gold in the mines. Hello. Are you in a financial desert tonight? Are you in a relationship desert tonight? your family going through a desert tonight? Hey, God can make it like gold. That's rich. That's pure. See, gold is a symbol of, of kingship. It's a, pure, a, a symbol of purity. It's, it's, oh, my goodness. It doesn't get any better than this. Man, I'll tell you what. When you get in the desert and you're hot and you're thirsty, I'm glad God's going to shave my right hand. And I'm glad that he's going to shave me as, as hot as it gets. And the desert can get really hot. And, boy, I'll tell you what. A, a shade in the desert, it's like gold. And then you know what else we find in that verse? Is there? Look at it with me. Read it with me. In verse uh, 5 and 6, we're looking at, The Lord is thy keeper, and the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Verse 6, The sun shall not smite thee by day. Somebody tell me, amen, that's a blessing. Okay? Nor the moon by night. Guess what? The moon isn't even going to get you, even though China wants it. Amen. Oh, you see, shade in the desert you see, when you're in the weary desert and you're hot and you're tired and you're beaten down and, and you just don't feel like you can take another step in the desert, I don't, I don't think we're going to make it. 
I'm thirsty, my, my lips are t- uh, parched, my tongue's parched, and, and oh my, and you're looking, and pretty soon you get to see it, and you're looking out, and you think, oh, there's an oasis ahead of you, and it's nothing more than a mirage. And you keep going from mirage to mirage, and then just to find out that, that when you get there, or, or once you find all of a sudden, who knows, a turn around the corner or just over the little desert, you know, the mound, the dune, and you're, you're struggling to get up to it, and, and you get, and you may be even crawling, and you get to the top of it, and you see there's a, a palm tree out in the middle of nowhere. And you go over there, and you get under that palm tree, and it provides you with shade. You know what it does? It gives you rest. It'll let you rest your soul. It'll give you rest. What did Jesus say in 1128 of Matthew? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I found many verses on rest for your soul in the Lord. He's that, he's going to, you know, while we're in this journey of life, we're walking. Sometimes we're racing. Sometimes we're in a battle. This battle happens to be on the desert. We're hot. We're tired. We're parched. We're exhausted. We don't have any more strength. That's why we're going to look at strength for the journey. You're going to like it. I think you'll enjoy it. All right? And then all of a sudden, God gives us some shade. And he gives us some rest in this journey. And how refreshing that is. Oh, my. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, let's move on. Let's look at the next one, number four. So we've learned tonight he's my helper, helpless me. We've looked at our condition. Then we find he's our keeper, he's our guardian. But I want you to know something else. Not only does he keep and guard you, but he preserves you. He's your life preserver. He's my life preserver. How many of you know what a life preserver is? How many of you like those when you're out on the boat and the boat's going down? Or are you not swimming and somebody comes by and throws you a life preserver? You know, well, how about my life preserver, verses 6 and 7? We find Jesus is our life preserver. Look at it. And we looked about the sun. It won't smote us by day, the moon by night. The Lord shall, verse 7, shall preserve thee. Say, God's going to preserve me. How many of you believe that? Say it with me. God's going to preserve me. And what is he going to preserve you from? All evil. You see the next line there? And he also shall preserve thy soul. So we find here the, uh, the life preserver. In verses 7 and 8, we see the Lord shall preserve. And the word also there can be protect me. I mean, Hezekiah is in trouble. He needs some protection. And he's crying out to the Lord. And we have this psalm, no matter what we're going through, church, as believers, God has promised he's going to protect us. Now, you want to go out here and live like the devil yourself, don't expect God to protect you. you know, what he'll do is he'll let him beat you up a little bit, then he'll take care of you. Be there. The Lord protects me from how much evil? All evil. Or, in other words, you could put it this way. The Lord protects me uh, here uh, from the problem of wickedness. How many believe we're living in a wicked world? How many believe we've got a lot of wickedness around us? Now, the Lord will protect you from it, but now it's kind of hard when you allow it into your life. Okay? Here you want God's protection and guarding and keeping you, but yet you're out here living in all the wild w- uh, wickedness. Or here you're allowing it all to come into your house, by the way, the, the boob tube. When I grew up in the 50s, it was called a boob tube. Okay? Amen? Don't let the devil come into your home through the television. You say, oh, I can't. He does. You sit there and let all that trash and garbage come into your house, and you have opened up your house. You've opened up your heart's door to allow the devil. You've given him permission to come into you with all that garbage and trash and the filth that's on there. Don't don't allow it. Don't allow it. That's if you want God to protect you. Oh, my goodness, you know, the Lord protects me from all evil or the problem of wickedness there in verse 7. The Lord preserves my soul in verse 7. Let's see there in your outline, D. The Lord protects my coming and going. Look at verse 8. But now, wait a minute. If your coming and going is into all the bars and the lounges and everything else and the bad places and the bad houses and everything else, don't expect God to protect you. 
You want to get out here on the freeway out here and drive 100, 110, 120 miles an hour, your guardian angel has done flown off. He, he, he's done gone off. He said, man, I'm riding, I'm riding in this car with this fool. He's crazy. I mean, if you're going to act foolish and dumb and stupid and drive 120 miles an hour on a freeway out there, don't expect God. And then you get in a bad accident, roll over about 20 times and down the hill and off over the bridge and everything, and you happen to live through it. Don't say, uh, uh, God, what happened? I can't believe this. My, my, my. Sometimes you see, folks, we bring it on ourselves. It's not, the, it's not the Lord's fault. Don't blame Him. It's not His fault. You need to be careful where you're coming and going. See? Don't be coming and going in and out of all the bars and everything else and all the bad houses and the, and the pot houses and the drug houses and, and the illicit sex houses and all that stuff. Don't be coming and going out of all that. God's not going to protect you from all that. You come down with a venereal disease or something else. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. You stay pure and clean and you married a good husband and a good wife and a good man and, and then the Bible says and as long as that's underneath there the Bible says that the bed is undefiled in all of that. That's God's plan and God's method. Oh, I tell you, the problem, and see when we, have, when we talk about going and coming we're talking about there's a problem with waywardness. See, if you're living waywardness then, then, then don't expect God to be your knight in shining armor. Oh, he still loves you. Of course he does. He's never going to abandon you and desert you. But hey, man, the, the, uh, the heartache and all you're going to go through with all that, it isn't going to be pleasant because there are consequences to sin, church. Okay, God forgives, but there are consequences to it. All right, there's always consequences. And there's always consequences with the choices we make. You make good choices, you're going to have good consequences 99% of the time. You make bad choices, poor choices, guess what? There's going to be bad consequences, poor consequences 99% of the time. So the psalmist is trying to encourage us in, that we have this problem of wickedness because the Bible says, my heart is desperately wicked, who can know it? That's what the Bible says. And David says, God, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Know my thoughts, David said. So we're going to hide nothing from the Lord. You see, he knows it all. He sees it all. So we have a problem with that. And today we have a problem with the church because half the time they don't want to come. Why, what are they doing? They're coming and going, this waywardness. And so we wonder why we're going through. Well, let's look at number five. The Lord's preservation. The Lord's preservation. Now we're going to go back up to verses three and four again. The Lord's preservation. Notice what he says as we look at it. He keeps me from stumbling. Look at verse 3 with me. All right. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Okay. God's going to keep you from stumbling. He's a preservation. The Lord keeps you from stumbling. And we, and we notice that God is watching me. How many believe God is watching me? The Bible says his eyes run to and fro on the earth looking. The Bible says he's looking for someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and stand in the gap. The eyes are going to and fro on the earth looking for somebody he can pour out his spirit into. I want to be that man. I want to be that man that God can use to stand in the gap in the hedge and make up the hedge. I want to be that man that God finds. There's a man I can pour my spirit into. But you see, I can't be out here living wayward and in wickedness and, that, and God expect God to do that. You know, no, it's not, that's not going to happen. But God is watching me. You all know the old song. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. See, God's watching. God's watching. He sees wherever we go, whatever we do, and our going and coming. Okay? And I'll tell you, if you're living righteously and living for Him, He's going to keep your foot from stumbling. It says He will not let your foot be moved. All right? Remember God's faithfulness to Israel. You read that in verse 4. Look at verse 4, what it says. All right, verse 4. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. How many believe God will keep you? How many believe God's faithful? Huh? Aren't you glad that God doesn't depend on our faithfulness to, compared to His? 
But isn't it amazing? We always want God to be faithful to us, right? Well, you know what? God wants the same thing from us. He wants us to be faithful. I mean, fair is fair, right? Well, God expects that from us. Psalms 89.1 says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Lamentations 3.23, if you read verse 22, he's talking about the, 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 the Lord's mercies there. And, and he comes into verse 23 and says, They are new every morning. What? God's mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful. And I'm glad that God doesn't gauge his faithfulness on our faithfulness. If that was the case, church, how faithful would God be? If he based it on your life or my life, you know, in your life, whatever. It's a good thing to ask yourselves that. All right, be there. The Lord keeps, he protects me all hours, day and night. Look at verse 6. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. In other words, God's going to keep you. God's going to preserve you. God's going to protect you day and night. What a blessing these are. What promises these are uh, of the Lord as we're on life's journey. All of this is why we're climbing up the hill. All of this is where we're going. We've come down the hill. Now we're going across the desert. Wow, praise the Lord. Look at see. The Lord preserves my soul in verse 7. He shall preserve thy soul. This is God's preservation. Look at verse 8. The Lord protects my coming and going. And, and, and how does he protect my coming and going? Sun by the day, moon by the night. <laughs> That's in verse 6, all right? Praise the Lord. Amen? All right? And then even we're done. The Lord preserves my life. Look at verse 7 again with me. There's a lot in each verse. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord preserves my life. Uh, I don't know who wrote this psalm because we don't have it. It could be one of the orphan psalms. Uh, it was written about the time of Hezekiah going through all of this. Okay. He preserves my life. Well, when does God preserve our lives? in the good and bad from all evil. Look at verse 7. Again, you see, you didn't know how much was in there, did you? The Lord preserves these from all evil. He preserves you and I from the good and bad. In this life, God preserves your soul in this life. And then you know what else I like about that verse, verse 8? See, look at verse 8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God's going to preserve you and I forever in the future life forevermore. And that's, of course, coming on the horizon. At the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, the millennium, now, just think, folks, most of us, we live the 70, 80, 90, if we're lucky. We're talking about a 1,000 years. That's a long time. And then just think, when that's finished, we have to start eternity. Whoa. See, our, our little minds don't even comprehend all of this, what God has for us. And it's a good thing probably he doesn't let us because we'd probably blow our minds, amen? <laughs> we, we, we'd go nuts. We'd lose it because it's just, it's just, just it's so fantastic. And so awesome. And so we praise the Lord. So let's let the Lord be our helper. In the days ahead, when you're climbing the hill of life, okay, when you find yourself in the desert place, amen, and don't hesitate to cry out because we're helpless. That's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. That's what he told his disciples. And that happened to be about bearing fruit, much fruit, bearing fruit in John 15. Okay? And he said, without me, gentlemen, this is just before he was going to the cross. This was in the upper room before he would be arrested that night. And he said, fellows, without me. Because in chapter 14, he just got through talking about, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me, my Father's house, many mansions, you know. And he goes on with that until you get to the last verse of chapter 14. And you ought to read that. Because then that takes us over into chapter 15 where he now is instructing them how he wants to live, how he wants them to live for him. Okay? In chapter 15. And then when he does and he gives them these instructions, I think it is verses 1 through 5 concerning about bearing fruit, much fruit, and all that kind of stuff. And pruning and purging and cleansing and all that is in those verses. And then he says, and just let me put on a tag here at the last part of verse 5. Without me, you can do nothing. So, wow. That's why we need him. And I'm glad he's my helper. I'm glad he doesn't sleep. I'm glad he's not slumber. I'm glad he's not taking a nap. I'm glad he's always there when you call. You're not put on hold. You don't have to make a reservation. Uh, I mean, wasn't that fantastic? And you just cry out, God, I need your help. And, and, and I do like sometimes the commercials on TV. You know, they're all hollering out in the streets and out the windows and everything. It's my money and I want it now. And I say, God, I need your help and I need it now. And I, 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 I say that. And I, I say, Lord, I mean that. I know you may look at the situation and think this is nothing. This is a piece of cake. This is like a Sunday school class with the boys and girls. It's a walk in the park. Well, that's to you, but to me, I need it now. Help. Help me, please. I need help. Amen. Cry out unto the Lord. Hey, if Hezekiah can do it, David did it. King David. Hey, guys, we're no different than those guys. And they needed help in times, especially of desperation. And I mean that. I don't know what everybody's going through, but I know we all need help. Everybody needs help. Okay? Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this little message from Psalms. Lord, just eight little verses, but, oh, there's so much more in those verses. Oh, we could have shared with uh, so much more that you have for us in there. But thank you for what you did give us tonight. And I pray that we've learned some things from it. And just I pray that we'll go back over it again. Uh, tonight we go home, maybe before we go to bed, just, just read it. Eight little verses, 10 seconds. Then read it a little slower. Make it 15 seconds. Then a little slower, 20 seconds. And just meditate on the Word and what God says. And then claim it for your life and say Lord I've read it now I believe it Lord I need your help and you can always tag on please I don't mind doing that so, Lord thank you for what we learned tonight thank you that you're our helper you keep us you preserve us well thank you Lord thank you you watch over us thank you you guard us these days in which we're living Sometimes we're climbing mountains. Sometimes we're down in the valley. Sometimes we're crossing the desert. But whatever it is, from whence, from whence cometh my help, I will look to the hills. I will look up, for the Lord is my helper. Thank you, God. We bless you, Lord. We love you. Give us traveling mercies home now, if you would, please. Grant a good night's rest to us, please, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2 says what? Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's who we got to look to when you're at the bottom, folks. Don't look to the world. Don't look to the psychiatrist. Don't look to the neighbors. I mean, man, you, when you're in the bottom, you better look up. And that's what's good. When God puts us in the bottom, church, we got nowhere else to look but to look up. Even in the belly of the whale, we can still look up. Because David says, if I ascend into heaven, Thou art there. David said, if I ascend into hell, thou art there. You see, no matter where we go, he's there. God was in the well with Jonah. Why not? He made him. I've told her, if I die now, you put on my tombstone. It's nothing else. Here lies a man that was accused and blamed of preaching the gospel. 
And I've had people not come to this church because of that. I'm not going over there because all that guy does is preaches the salvation and the gospel. Well, why don't you come back on Wednesday night and get in a Bible study? And why don't you come back on Sunday night and get in a Bible study? And why don't you come on Sunday morning and go through Hebrews, one of the greatest books in the Bible, and get into a Bible study? And so we'll preach salvation on Sunday morning, but we'll study the Bible the rest of the time, verse by verse, phrase by phrase. But guess what? As we go through it verse by verse and phrase by phrase, you're going to hear the gospel. You're going to hear about getting saved in salvation because it's from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 on every page. The new year, church, is God's gift to us. What we do, church, with this new year is what our gift will be to Him. What I want to do with it is purpose in my heart to put the Word of God in my heart and keep it there. I would like to purpose in my heart to honor Christ in all what I do, in all things, what I say and do. And I would like to purpose in my heart this year, church, to give God thanks, to thank God for his inheritance that he's given to me, to have a heart of gratitude, of attitude of gratitude. And by all means, oh God, thank you for your mercy today. That's why I love it when the Bible says that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So no matter where I go, church, goodness and mercy is following me. I don't have to worry which way I turn. Goodness and mercy. If I happen to look around, I'm only going to see one set of footprints in the sand because he's carrying me. And mercy is going to be there for me. His grace is going to be there for me. The Bible says that my righteousness, any righteousness that I have, is as filthy rags. And those filthy rags that he's talking about were the rags that they wrapped uh, the arms and the people's heads in bandages of what was what they called wet and, and running uh, leprosy. It was wet leprosy, the pus rags of, of wet leprosy, not dry leprosy, but wet leprosy. God says your righteousness is as filthy as that. And leprosy was a type or picture of sin. And so God says, your righteousness is as filthy as sin. Well, I don't want to hear that. Because I love you, I tell you the truth. I hope I don't become your enemy. Because you see, when you know the truth, church, you will be free. You be, the truth will make you free, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus went down a few verses later in John there, and he says, and the truth, and if you have the truth, you shall be free indeed. He didn't come politically. He didn't come socially. He didn't come for, he came for one purpose, and that was to die. He was born to die. Simeon come tonight, and we're going to see the prophecy of that of Simeon. He was born to die, to go to a cross, and therefore those gauze, uh, those swaddling clothes were symbolic of his death. And that's why when the wise men came and they presented him with gold, that's kingship. They presented him with frankincense. That's the high priest. Watch this. He's king. He's high priest. But they also presented him with myrrh because he would go to the cross and die and resurrect as the king of kings and the Lord of lords to the glory of God. Hallelujah. There's not only the pronouncement that Jesus Christ is exalted, but I want you to see the prophecy. Oh, I want you to see the prophecy. Don't miss this. Don't miss this prophecy that Jesus Christ will be worshiped by all who have ever lived. See, we're talking about worship today and the proper worship. Did you realize that, that Jesus will be worshiped by all who ever lived? We find that in verse 10 now. See, we're going to move to verse 10 now. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Are you with me, church? How many knees? Every knee shall bow. Bow shows submission. Bow, bowing is showing of submission. 
Everybody one day is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Everyone who's ever walked this planet from the beginning of the first couple, Adam and Eve, until the last on this planet are going to one day bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow. That's showing submission. Everyone will be humble before God or they will be humbled by God. One or the other. Which one you want? So you can humble yourself before God now in submission to Him and His authority and His gospel and receive Christ and all of that. Or one day, my friend, you will still bow your knee. I've heard the biggest and the toughest in witnessing and going through the years tell me I'll never bow my name to any Jesus or any Christ or any God or anything else. I've got good news for you, big boy or big lady, whoever you are or all and mighty, whoever think you are. There's coming a day when one day you will bow your knee and worship God, whether here or in the underworld or in hell, you will still bow your knee and worship God. All those that refuse Christ, refuse to be saved, and will die lost without Christ, guess what? You're not done. It's not over. You, all, you too will live for eternity. It's just a matter where you're going to live. You're either going to live in glory in heaven with Christ, the one we're preaching about, or you're going to live in hell with the fallen angels and demons and all that rejected Christ, which is still going to be as much as alive. You're going to be even more alive than you are now. And you know what you're going to be doing besides suffering the pain and the agony and the torment and all of that that the, the rich man described to us in Luke's gospel and when he went down there? You're going to be worshiping God. Hallelujah. Even the underworld one day will worship the Lord God Almighty. Why not do it now? Why not do it when you can? By the way, mercy, again, let me get another definition of it here. Mercy is compassion in action. It assists the helpless. And mercy is bearing someone else's burden so that they no longer have a burden. That's what mercy is. And I see a lot of that going on in our church. And I want to thank all of you that are involved in that. I see this example being lived out and some of you that are showing mercy and having mercy on the helpless and, and, and giving that and, and they may never show mercy back because we don't have that guarantee, but you have the guarantee that God will show you mercy. And so whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if you sow mercy, you shall reap mercy. But mercy is taking someone else's burden and taking it off of them. And isn't that exactly, church, what Jesus did for us? We sing the song that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus took our burden. He showed us mercy. And he took our burdens on Calvary. And he lifted them off of us. That they were no longer our burden. Because our burden was sin. Our burden was eternal damnation in a place called hell. Our burden was without no hope. Our burden was lost. And Jesus took all of our burdens upon him on the cross and took and lifted those burdens off of us. And they were no longer our burdens. And so, I mean, wow, you can say hallelujah and praise the Lord for that. And so I see some of you doing that. Uh, I see that in the Baker family. I see that in the Warren family and, and, and others that are, are doing uh, this and, and so forth. I see it in the, in the Bertram family, uh, you know, and uh, one of our sisters, you see, that a lot of mercy was showing and helping to relieve the burden. So praise the Lord for those of you that do that. And, and thank you. And, and, and we see Christ in you. And we, we see you relieving folks of their burden. And, and that's going to produce a pure heart. Amen. Oh, praise God. God looketh on the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance. And so uh, he says, we'll have a pure heart. 1 Samuel 16, 9 says, Then Jesse made a Shemoth uh, to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Now you've got to go read the story there in 1 Samuel. All right? Uh, you will, uh, Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart 
Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now let me tell you some things here real quickly. First of all, you will never get to God through the head approach. That's knowledge. That was the Galatians. You will never get to God through the hand approach. That's works. Okay? The only way you get to God is through the heart approach. We have to approach God with our heart. 